All rise, Jerry Henry. Okay, hey, Brigadier, welcome back. We're going to have a seat, and you may proceed with your direct examination. Thank you, Your Honor. Dr. Henderson, from the review of, of the records that you received from the medical examiner's office, did it appear to you that uh, some vaginal swabs were taken, collected on May 17th? Yes, absolutely. And mm -hmm. vaginal swabs from the victim, Felicia Williams? Yes. And uh, in looking at the photographs of what's been described as artifacts, the two artifacts in the vaginal area of Felicia Williams, um, does that look to you? Well, let me ask you this first. Are you familiar with collecting vaginal swabs? Yes, very much. Okay, could you describe to the jury how that's done? Well, basically, what, for the DNA swabs, you take cotton swabs, and you basically spread the labia, and you put the swabs in, and you're basically swabbing around. And in doing that, uh, you know, you're collecting possibly any sperm that might be there, any seminal fluid and so forth, because that's what you're looking at. Okay. And then you take those out and dry them, and then they're submitted to uh, forensics for analysis. Okay. And, and uh, is it your belief that the images that you see of the, those two white areas in the vaginal area that that could have been caused by the vaginal swabbing? Yes, that's my opinion, because it's happened to me on several times over the course of my career. Okay. And, and Dr. Anderson, um, you based that on, on seeing records that suggest that those were collected on May 17th? Yes, that's what, the, that's what the record indicates. When it was turned over to the crime lab technician, the date is signed by the technician, and that is the 17th. Or whoever that person is that it's turned yes. over to. Okay. And, and then the, your review of the records also indicate that the medical, I mean, that the autopsy itself took place on the 18th. Correct. That's okay. when those pictures were taken. Okay. So there had been manipulation in that area prior to the pictures being taken. Okay. And the pathologist actually describes those, uh, it, those changes as basically uh, gray-white, no hemorrhage, and even does microscopics of, the exa of that okay. area. L let, me, let me wait for my question. And then, um, so Dr. Anderson, my, my next question is, let, let's assume for, the, for, for a moment that maybe you're mistaken as far as how you believe that that okay. happened, okay? Uh, the looking at those two white areas, it's your belief based on the appearance of those areas that they're artifacts and not injuries, right? The post-mortem artifacts. Yes. Post-mortem artifacts, meaning it happened after that. Correct. Okay. And the medical examiner basically had arrived at the same conclusion, right? Yes. Okay. Correct. Now, did the medical examiner take it a step further for purposes of those particular areas to do further examination to corroborate or confirm that these are, in fact, artifacts and not injuries? Yes, he did. And what did he do to, uh, for purposes of that? He basically does, took a biopsy. He took biopsies of that area. And then we just take, take sections, and then just like we would a regular biopsy, a surgical path biopsy. We process those, and you look at it under the microscope. And the conclusion was that there was no trauma, no injury, no hemorrhage in that area. Okay. When you're looking under the microscope, what are you looking for? Well, essentially, you're looking for is there, when, when an injury occurs... The blood vessels are injured, too. So the blood comes out of the vessels and into the, in all the tissue around it. So now you're looking at, under the microscope, you don't see just blood in the vessels. You see, and of course there's vessels in the skin, so you're going to see some red blood cells, obviously, in the vessels. But uh, there are large amounts of blood that have come out into the soft tissues, which would indicate that when the injury took place, the blood was still had blood pressure. So the pressure was then pushing the blood out into that area. If you don't have that, that means that that area did not have trauma while there was basically circulation, broke blood pressure going on. Okay. Um, there's been testimony about the fact that that area where, where, where you see these two uh, uh, white artifacts uh, is very protected. Is it, there's a very protected area compared to other parts of the body. Well, I mean, it's, sure, it's between, the, it's between the legs, so it's protected unless you do something like open the legs to take, sure. take a swab. I mean, right. it's not protected sure. at that point. Sure, sure. But, but my question is, 
would you, if, if the body has been in the water for an extended time period, would you still expect to see blood under the microscope when you're looking at those um, two areas? Yeah, because they're in the tissue. They're inside. The, the, the water doesn't get in there. The, basically, they're underneath the skin. So if you're even in the water, the water doesn't go through your skin into your soft tissues. Okay. So when you don't see blood, either visually or under the microscope, that aids you in determining that this is an artifact and not an injury. Correct. Dr. Anderson, the um, is. Do you see any evidence in the autopsy report and the photographs that would suggest to you that a sexual assault, sexual battery, had taken place in this case? No. In the, um, did you also uh, look at the FDLE uh, DNA findings from uh, from this um, uh, sex assault kit? Yes. Anything in there that's relevant for purposes of, of your conclusions or opinions in this case? Well, I believe, as I recall, there were no uh, there was no foreign DNA found in any of the swabs. Okay. All right. Um, was there any blood found in in, uh, in any of the swabs? Apparently, there was a small amount of the victim's blood. Small amount of the victim's blood. Okay. Or a DNA match with the. Uh, I'm sorry. A DNA match with the victim's blood. Okay. All right. Um, what, if anything, does that suggest to you? Well, it doesn't suggest one way or another. I mean, there was blood there, but there was no injury. Uh, it could have been menstrual blood. It could have just been blood taken out when you're scraping the mucosa, you're going to pick up some red blood cells, even though there's no circulation. Okay. The fact, if, if, if the history that was presented suggested that, that the victim was not menstruating yet, does that in, in and of itself suggest, does that in and of itself prove that she was not menstruating? No, actually, uh, it doesn't. It could have been early flow. It could have just been scraping when you do the swabs. It could have been a little area there that uh, scraped off some some uh, red blood cells. That's usually why you, you don't, you know, the uh, the presence of the, the victim's own DNA doesn't mean a lot. It could it could be actually it could be from the from the cells themselves that uh, scraped off, even though there was some blood. Have a moment. Yes. That's why. This evidence release sheet that you're talking about, that you've looked at now? Yes. You're not suggesting there was any impropriety in the collection of the evidence or the chain of custody of that evidence, correct? No. In fact, I'm suggesting just the opposite, that that, that very well documents the fact right. that it was collected prior to. So correct. No, absolutely no problem. It's uh, just the opposite. It was very well done. Yeah. In and fact, it, the medical examiner was wise to actually do that before uh, a lot of time had passed. Right. And, and right, that's practice to get that done as soon as possible, correct? Yeah, it's very good practice. All right, to try to collect evidence before something happens or something happens to the yes, body. Yes, I said it's good practice. Okay. And in fact, bodies are routinely, after they're processed for trace evidence like that, before autopsy, they're washed or cleaned, aren't they? Uh, it depends. Uh, usually not washed and cleaned prior to photos being taken in the autopsy room. We would always take right. basically photos of the body as they get there and then clean it up. But you don't take no photos until you clean it up. Right. So there's pho photography done before and then as you begin your external examination of a clean body for continuing photography is best practice. Sure, right. right. Okay. Including into the internal uh, yes, of course. examination during the autopsy, right? Correct. Okay. So in this case, Dr. Kurz released those swabs to a Lord Guevara within the MEO, right? I'm sorry, within? Within the medical examiner's office. She works for the medical examiner's okay, office. Okay, right. Right. 
And then the following day, that evidence was released from Laura Guevara from the medical examiner's office to a Timothy Elmer. Well, that may be true. I didn't even read that part. My only concern was okay. that this documents that they were taken on the 17th. All right. So I'm showing you here, released by Wayne Kerr's MD, released to Laura Guevara, agency MEO. So she works for the medical examiner's office. Okay. Released by Laura Guevara, MEO, released to Timothy Elmer, Temple Terrace PD on May 18th, 2014. All right. Okay. And... In the, the, Which would be the standard procedure? In the situations you, t you testified to, you said that using a cotton tip swab that you may have scraped across skin before when you were collecting evidence? Yes. Okay. And a sex, -a -kit, a sex assault kit? Sure. And you documented that in your report, correct? Well, I would, if it was postmortem, if I realized it was postmortem artifact, I would call it postmortem artifact, which is exactly what Dr. Curtis did, actually. He right. documented that as, right. as postmortem. But if he had caused that when he was doing swabs, he wouldn't have come in here and testified that he believed that was caused by rocks at the scene, would he? I don't know. I'm not here. I, as a scientist, as I said before, I don't read reports. I'm not here to contradict anybody's testimony. I'm basically to call it as I see it. So I don't know what Dr. Kurt said. I don't read transcripts. I don't need, need depots. So I don't know. I'm not here to refute anybody. I'm here to basically present, as a scientist, my best opinion as to what happened. And if you did that as a medical examiner, and when you did that in the past, you reported it in your report that that was caused during collection of evidence with a sex assault kit. Not necessarily. I might just, since I knew that, I might just put postmortem artifact. But you certainly wouldn't have come into court under oath and testified that those injuries were caused by some other agency, correct? No, I would obviously I would say that. In those cases that you had, if you had been called to court to testify to those injuries, you would have said, well, those couple of injuries were caused when I was collecting DNA with a swab. Well, that would have been obviously the best if he, under, if he actually recognized he was doing it. Now, sometimes you'll basically scrape something off, it doesn't come all the way off, and then later on it slips off. So he may not have realized uh, that he did it. Okay. Well, that's not what I asked, so why are you adding that? You said, why would I do it? No, I said you would come in and testify to that if you did that, right? Well, if it was asked, yes. But if I just called it postmortem artifact, it might not even come up because basically, if that's the only thing you find, there's really no basis for a diagnosis of, the, of a sexual assault. And if I understand your testimony about this asphyxia theory of yours, um, you do not believe that the victim that this occurred to the victim while she was being transported in a motor vehicle? I think it would be very difficult to, right. to do that. Okay. And you would agree with me that it would be much easier to secure and mask or hide a dead body than a live person, correct? Uh, well, I guess that would all depend on the circumstances. Well, if the live person is alive and they're animated and they're conscious and they're moving and they have vocal cords and they can talk. Well, but you're assuming that live person is conscious. Have I'm not assuming animated. that. I'm, t I'm just saying that for my example. Well, but by live person does not necessarily mean they're not unconscious. Okay. Well, if they were still conscious. And if they were some resistance, yeah. And they were able to speak and talk and move about, they would be harder to conceal than a dead body, correct? I would say generally that's right. a fact, yes. Now, you've indicated that this, if Felicia had died the way you're suggesting, and just to be clear, is that your opinion? Is what my opinion? What that she died from, from compressive asphyxia? From compression of that area, which included partially obstructing the larynx as well. Okay. Um, her manner of death was homicide? Is that Correct. your opinion? Yes. Okay. But this wouldn't have been a quick death, correct? As, as I said, probably judging by the lungs, we're looking at probably 10 to 15 to 20 minutes of, of basically sustained pressure. Okay.
you told counsel that you believe that consciousness would have been lost in a minute? Roughly, probably a minute or two. A minute? Okay. Could it be minutes? Well, it's several minutes, yeah. I said a minute or two. It varies so much on the individual and how much pressure is actually exerted first. There might have been a period of time uh, where the pressure wasn't enough to completely interfere with everything, and she was even conscious for longer than that. And so it could have been minutes? Could have been minutes. Okay. And for those minutes, when the person's having this compression put on their chest, they would have been struggling, correct? Well, I would assume there probably would be some reaction to, to that happening, yes. This is an event that you're describing that is a single compressive event that is continuous, correct? Over a period of time, yes. Over a period of time. So if the person's conscious, they're going to be struggling, right? Yeah, for that period of time, most likely, yes. And they're going to be trying to do their best to get away from that pressure, correct? Well, they, yeah, they may be, the difference of size may be so great that they just can, simply can't do anything but wiggle a little bit and they can't get away from it. But they're going to do their best to get away from it because it's killing them, right? They can't well, breathe. Well, that's... Correct? That's really not a forensic pathology issue as to what the individual might or may not do. The reaction of a human being? You said you were a scientist, correct? Correct. All right. So... A reaction of a human being is going to involve emotion, fear, anxiety, apprehension, things like that, correct? It would all depend upon the condition of the individual at the time. If she became unconscious right away... I'm not talking about unconsciousness. I'm talking about when they're conscious. I said if, which means there would have been a short period of consciousness. The struggle would have been less. If, that, if, and there probably was some effort to get away, I would think, yes. If this nine-year-old girl's on the ground or against a wall, however she's being compressed, and someone's either has her leg on them, so when you say the foreleg, you mean the shin, right? Right. Okay. So someone's doing this. They're leaning down on, on, her, on her chest. And you're talking, for the record, about from here to here, across here, right? Correct. Because your whole opinion is based on the fact that there's bruising on the anterior muscles of her shoulder, correct? Correct. And you're saying you can't resolve it otherwise, right? You can't account for those injuries with a strangulation. That, that in the absence of enough injury to the neck, the actual larynx that would say the neck was individually okay. compressed. But you said previously that it was the injuries to the shoulders and your inability to resolve that with a strangulation. That was the base, one well, of the major bases of your opinion, correct? Correct. As, as what we do is we look at the injuries and then come to the conclusion. We don't say, we don't come up with a diagnosis first with this strangulation and then try to basically explain away, explain or explain away the evidence that, that doesn't happen to match. This matches perfectly with some, we don't have the evidence of any sufficient amount of neck compression for a prolonged enough period of time to allow this lung to become heavy. And that's why I think this was a much more gradual process, continued pressure, until the time she actually became, uh, the demon was bad enough that she died. Continuous pressure over a great deal of time, right? 10, 15, Probably 20 yes, minutes, you yes. said. Mm -hmm. And if she is conscious for minutes during that, she's going to do whatever she can to get away from it, correct? Correct. All right. And throughout your career, you've testified to um, conducting all of these autopsies, 9,000 autopsies. You have only seen compressive asphyxia a couple of times, correct? Homicidal. From a homicide, yes. I mean, we've seen a lot of uh, situations where uh, something falls on a child or falls on an adult, the chest is compressed, uh, sometimes in, uh, when a ditch caves in and compresses the individual. So we've seen a lot of those. But compression from a homicide is... Uh, from hom a homicide resulting in compression or from that mechanism is unusual. Right. You said I've seen, a, and I'm talking about from your deposition, you've seen a couple of these over your career, correct? Of homicidal asphyxia, yes. When someone was basically had weight put down on their body. Or and any, sustained, any type of compression. And sustained long enough to cause death, correct. correct? Correct. And you indicated it wasn't a particularly quick or rapid death, correct? Correct, correct. As I said, we have evidence that shows that it took a period of time for her to die after the was initiated. 
And if an object was being used to cause this, such as a baseball bat or a two-by-four or something like that, and again, we're talking about across here, correct? Correct. All right. Across the clavicle, the shoulders, and the lower neck right here? Correct. Mm -hmm. Okay. That object would have to have a lot of weight behind it, wouldn't it? A significant well, amount of weight. As I said, it would be enough that an adult, any adult could inflict that on a child. This type of injury is a type of injury that's typical of people that are caught, caught partially entrapped in cave-ins, correct? That's just what I said, yes. Yeah, you said that in your deposition, correct? I just said it a minute ago when we were discussing the mechanism. You did. So that, and you said that sort of thing where they have a lot of pressure on the chest applied, correct? Correct. So you're talking about almost like an industrial amount of strength or pressure being applied across that small area, correct? Well, it dep yeah, but I mean, it, it, it doesn't mean you have to have 10,000 pounds. If you've got 150 pounds pressing down on you, and with force, not just the weight, but also the force, because you have taken into account the individual, if it's an individual holding something, the, they're pressing, so they're putting a lot more force than just their body weight into it, because they're using their muscles to actually press down. Now, the edema in the lungs, I want to talk to you about that. Pulmonary edema is fluid in the lungs, correct? As I indicated, it's a backup of pressure right. in the lungs that causes the serum in the blood to transfer over into the alveolar spaces. Into the air spaces, the correct. air sacs, right. Correct. And that can, that can occur fairly rapidly, though, can it? Yeah, usually it can occur within probably five to ten minutes. It can even occur quicker than that, can well, it? Well, I don't know. It's pretty, it's pretty hard to get that that much edema that quickly. And you told us that that's a diagnosis of edema in the lungs that can be made and is typically made by observation or microscopic examination of tissue from the lungs, correct? Ideally, yes. You didn't have that in this case, did you? Unfortunately, the medical examiner did not take sections of that. All right. And you are basing it solely on the weight of the lungs, correct? Yes. All right. And this body was deposited into water and was in the water for at least several hours, correct? Correct. So when a body's in the water, it causes a lot of reactions in the body, doesn't it? When water is exposed, when it's exposed to water like that. Well, not necessarily water going out into the, into the periphery of the lung. You may get some in the upper airway if a dead person is put in. Uh, but it's not going to be out into the lungs because they're not breathing. But, so, it, but it certainly could have permeated into the lungs over 17 hours, couldn't it, doctor? No, it doesn't come in from the outside. and You've only got so much going down the, the airway. And it's not, it wasn't described as an airway full of water. But isn't it true when bodies are pulled from the water, a lot of things like edema of the lungs are really, you can't make that determination when a body's been in the water that long. If they drown. What you can't determine is you can't determine <clears throat> if they inhaled water or if the, basically they were suffocated by the water and their heart failed and developed pulmonary edema. Now you can tell that sometimes if you do microscopics and particularly the distribution of it. But uh, there's not, in a drowning case, there's not a lot of water that's going in post-mortem. Now, maybe when they're in the drowning process, they may be taking the water. But this body, uh, I believe, was already dead when they put in the water. And when bodies come out of water, all bets are off as far as the kind of determinations you're talking about. Isn't that true? Not necessarily. Just making a diagnosis of edema based on weight alone without microscopic examination? Well, you would have to ask why the medical, if, if the medical examiner felt that, if that were the case, the medical examiner should have done the microscopic examination. You're making a diagnosis subjects. without those, though, here today, right? Based on simply on the weight of the lungs. That is most likely what it is, yes. It's very doubtful if this individual okay. was put in the water dead, that she would have been able to basically aspirate any water because she's not breathing anymore. All right, so now it's most likely that's what it is. Correct? Yes. And that's one of the basis of your opinion, correct? Well, that it took a period of time for her to die, yes. All right. One of the other bases of your opinion of this asphyxia, compressive asphyxia, that you've only seen a couple of in your entire career, is that there was petechiae on the pericardium or on the heart, correct? Correct. All right. That is a nonspecific finding, isn't it? Sure. Right, and it can be seen in all kinds of homicides and all kinds of deaths, correct? 
Well, generally speaking, um, we do a lot of autopsies, and we don't usually see that uh, in situations where, the, unless there's some respiratory compromise, where the individual is straining, therefore the little petechia are capillaries that burst. So if you're you're straining with the, the chest and basically increasing the pressure in your chest trying to breathe, you can increase the blood pressure in those little capillaries, and they basically can rupture. When you see them down below, it would be very unusual in a neck strangulation where everything's cut off, you see them above that, but you gen or hanging. Uh, you don't generally see them below that, and it's more. And you have to put everything together. You can't pick out an individual thing. You got to put everything together. And that's why we call these patterns of injury. Okay. So the petechiae in the heart is a non-specific finding, and it can be seen in all types of deaths, right? You can Correct. be seen yes. in natural deaths, right? Occasionally, if there's respiratory. But right. in the majority of natural deaths that I do, we don't see petechiae. You can see it in accidental deaths. If there's, yeah, usually though, if it's a situation where it's respiratory compromise, an individual is and you is can breathing. you can see it in other homicides, correct? Of course, that's why you don't pick out one particular thing; you pick out the whole, the totality of the injuries. And it's non, and since it's non-specific, it can also be associated to strangulation, correct? Sure. If you have other, if you have other evidence. <clears throat> okay. And the injuries to the interior of the shoulders, these injuries, which are the third basis of your opinion, correct? No, the injury pattern is the basis of my opinion. Uh -huh. the injury, we, have, we basically have linearity across the chest in a compressive situation where the individual appears to have suffered uh, increasing respiratory distress until the time they die. And we have those injuries. We don't have a lot of injuries up in the upper neck. Uh, but we do have those other injuries. In fact, there is extensive injuries in the upper structures of the neck, isn't there? Well, there's hemorrhage. But uh, if anybody that's in a child, if, you're, if your <clears throat> foreleg, for instance, across here, you're going to be in the neck area as well. But worse, uh, my theory is, my opinion is, that because this distribution of the injuries is more suggestive of the knee coming down, probably affecting some of the larynx as well. And you've talked about this uh, petechia of the heart and struggling to, ble to breathe, and that's that glottis effect, correct? Well, yeah, Valsalva. Right. And that can be caused by any situation where someone's struggling to breathe, correct? Yes. Like when they're being strangled, right? Well, if you've got other injuries that, that match that, yes. The, the effect is the same. You are, whether you're squeezing the neck here and cutting off everything, or if it's compressing here, you've got the same situation, basically, both are going to result in the same thing. And the injuries to Felicia's shoulders, those could have been caused, these these are blunt force, right? They're blunt force injuries to her shoulders? Well, they're, yeah, they're trauma. They're ev evidence of something interacting with that soft tissue. Right, that caused trauma. Right. Right. So if someone grabbed her shoulders in a forceful way, a grown man grabbed her shoulders to either shake her or move her, he could have caused those injuries, correct? Well, again, uh, not necessarily a grown man. I think that's uh, beyond... Well, I didn't ask you about other situations. I'm saying a grown man could have caused that. I, I indicated that in any event, an adult could have caused those situations. All right. So you don't want to say a man, right, because the defendant's a man? Is that why? No, I think you're prejudicing the case if you, as a scientist, if you make a determination because there's absolutely no evidence in the scientific analysis that points to, to sexual one way or another. All right. So... A man, a man could have done this, or a woman, in your opinion, correct? Right. Right. So, okay, if either one of them grabbed her by the shoulders, they could have caused these bruises to the interior muscles of her shoulders, correct? Yes. If they grabbed her and shook her, or they grabbed her and pushed her down onto the ground, it could have caused those injuries, correct? Yes, and probably, well, the head injury, we know, had, were in multiple impact injuries to the head. If she's on the ground, on her back, you could cause those injuries by leaning on her shoulders to pin her and hold her down, correct? Conceivably, yes. The compressive injury that you're talking about, or the compression across here that you've seen, in, or you've heard, I guess, of in cavens and other types of situations where people are being compressed, you said you've had a couple of homicides in your 9,000 autopsies where that's occurred. When that's occurring across this area, that includes this lower portion here of the neck, right? Right. This lower portion. 
according to you, correct? Well, and in a child, you're not, there's not going to be much difference between the, where the, uh, the clavicles and the sternum starts and the actual part of the neck. So if you're coming down across this, you're going to have compression to, to the airway as well. I mean, that's the whole problem. You have compression of the airway and plus restricting the ability so, to breathe. So when you have that compression going across that part of the body, this part of the body is not being compressed, right? Your stomach, from here down, is not being compressed, right? Right, but you are increasing blood back pressure, and that's why you get petechiae in various areas. Right, but this isn't being compressed. Correct. Well, depending upon the, the circumstance. Well, the, the circumstance that you've told this jury is most likely is someone kneeling down on this child like that with the lower part of their leg, Correct. right? Correct. So a linear surface area going from shoulder to shoulder right across the clavicle, right? Correct. Because if it's straight across, it's not going to come here and go up underneath the chin and then here. It's going to go right across here, right? Correct? Well, if you, if, but you have a child, it's much smaller, so you're, you're basically your leg will cover most of this entire area. But what we don't have is we don't have fracture of the larynx, a lot of pressure, a lot of hemorrhage in the larynx in the absence of anything right. else. And, and we don't have a crushed windpipe either, do we? Right? Well, we wouldn't necessarily get that with strangulation. Right. Well, I'm not saying that. I didn't ask you that. Why are you adding that? Did I ask you that? Did I say anything about strangulation? You were talking about strangulation, yes. All right. So, no, I'm talking about asphyxia. I'm talking about what your theory is in this case, okay? So okay. we're clear. She's got, a, she's got a force going across from shoulder to shoulder, across her clavicle, right? Right. Which you're saying could be either a forearm or could be the foreleg, I guess you called it, the shin, or something else that's linear, correct? Correct. All right. In that situation, there's no compression from just below that all the way down to here, correct? Correct. All right. And the diaphragm in the body extends much lower than here, right? Your lungs aren't right here underneath your uh, clavicles, correct? Your lungs obviously fill up your entire chest. Right. That's what and that's down here. You have a rib cage that's protecting all your internal organs, and your lungs come down, right? Correct. And your diaphragm comes down, correct? Correct. So the person would still be able to move their stomach in and out, correct? The diaphragm would still move. In fact, that pressure of moving like that is what causes those petechiae in the pericardium and in the thymus. But the person would still be able to breathe for, for a long while, correct? Well, the, right. The, what they're doing is you're partially compressing it. And that's why if you have partial compression over a period of time, that's why you have the edema. And that's, that's the basis for saying that it's a period, over a period of time. Now, the strap muscles and the injuries to the victim's neck. There was injury to multiple layers of the muscles in her neck, correct? Correct. There was hemorrhages in her sternocleidomastoid muscle, correct? Right, because the compression was basically all the way across here. Well, I appreciate that. I didn't ask you what your opinion was as how it was caused. I'm just asking you about the presence of the injuries. There was injuries on her ster sternocleidomastoid muscle, correct? Correct. Those are the external strap muscles. Correct. All right. There were injuries to the muscles below that, correct? Yes. And there was injuries up around the hyoid bone, right? There was some hemorrhage there, yes. All right. And where is the hyoid bone in the neck? Up in the top of the neck. It's in the top of the neck, right? Okay. <clears throat> the thyroid is in the upper neck too, isn't it? Well, it's in the middle. It's part way down. It's not okay. as high as the, the uh, thyroid cartilage. It's next to the thyroid cartilage and the hyoid's above that. The hyoid's above that and the mylohyoid is abo above the hyoid, right? It goes to the hyoid bone, yes. That's basically the floor of the mouth, the, the muscles that are form the floor of the mouth, right? Correct. The mylohyoid. And all of that's in the upper neck, correct? Well, yes. All right. And as Dr. Kurz, and you saw his photographs, as he dissected and revealed and went through the structures of the neck, he continued to find hemorrhages in the internal structures of the, of the neck, correct? Yes. Around the hyoid bone, right? And around the hyoid, in the hyoid area, yes, correct? Correct. In the upper neck, correct? Right. All right. And in fact, the longest muscle, where is the longest muscle? Probably the sternocleidomastoid. Well, I'm talking about the longest muscle that runs along the windpipe and along the back of the, uh, behind the trachea, along the spine. Well, the sternocleidomastoid, probably. Okay, that's what you're, you're talking about. The longest muscle? The deepest lying muscle in the neck? 
The last muscle depicted in the photographs. Okay, let's look at it real fast. States KB18. <clears throat> You can look up over your right hand shoulder. Do you recognize the photograph, first of all? Well, it's one of a number of photographs. Right. But do you recognize this area here? Yes, okay. All right. And these muscles here, what are these muscles? I, well, sternal, sternocleidomastoid, I think. I'd have to look at. States KB19. <clears throat> Do you recognize this as being the backbone? No, not from that picture, but that, yeah, I think that's that shows the. Uh the muscles deep in the back. Right. And this would be the vertebrae right here? Yes. And this would be the carotid artery that I've just circled here? Uh, a... Yes. Okay. And there is hemorrhaging up against the backbone, correct, in the muscles? Right. All right. And those are behind the trachea, are they not? Correct. And that, right. that means, that indicates to me that there was pressure being applied and compressing the back as well, and that's why you have hemorrhage in that whole area, rather than just confined to the neck. The reality is, doctor, you wouldn't have hemorrhage that deep against the backbone behind the trachea without this compressive force having crushed the trachea itself and compacted it down into that area. If you're having this all caused by a flat plane across the clavicle and across that area, correct? Well, no, you know, let me answer the question. If, when it's compressed, the trachea, as I indicated before, that's what's actually causing the respiratory distress, plus the pressure, but the compression of the trachea. The fact that you've got those in the deep muscles, if you were just grabbing here, how would you get those hemorrhages back in the deep musculature? So the deep musculature actually supports the fact that something is pressed down, as you're being pressed back, everything is being squeezed, so you're getting the hemorrhage in back in the back portion of the neck as well. States KB22. Do you recognize this as a removed trachea? Yes. All right. And this here, it's been cut, first of all, correct? Yes. To reveal the inside, right? Correct. And you recognize this as being hemorrhaging right here? Correct. It's in the trachea. All right. And you recognize this as depicting the trachea in a position... If it was still in the body, the person's face would be down flat on the paper and the back of his neck would be up in the air, correct? Well, I don't know that he's open at the front of the back, but it's, uh, yeah, it looks like it's from the front. Right, so this would be the back of the trachea that's facing the back, facing towards the vertebrae, correct? Yeah, that looks, that's in the way I would normally open it, so I'm presuming that. Right. I mean, you could open it from the other way, but I, I think right. this is. Probably we're in back looking front to the right. So we have hemorrhaging that's noted in Dr. Kurz's report on the back of the windpipe, on the back of the trachea, correct? Yeah, but now this is not in the larynx. This is way down here. This is the trachea is coming down here and then branches to the lungs. So that that well that that's my point, that if you have the if you have the pressure in the back and you have hemorrhages in the back, that means there's a force pressing down and this not is, just something including the neck. This is actually where the trachea falls flows into the lungs, correct? Yeah, and right above that is where he cut, and that's up in here. Right, but the trachea, wherever it is, if it's up in here well, or it, below, uh, there is injuries to the back of the trachea, correct? Well, it makes On a big the back difference. of the windpipe. It makes a big difference where it is, because this is down further. In fact, this is in the same plane that we've been talking about, compressing backwards. So you actually have hemorrhage in the back area at this point. So this would be uh, something that would be more likely that it's a compressive injury because you're squeezing the back. If you're just grabbing the neck like this, you're not going to be squeezing the back. Stage KB19. This isn't on the collarbone. This is up in the um, upper part of the neck, right? There's no way I can tell what that picture is from that <laughs> and where it is. 
that this is the this is the vertebrae here. That's the vertebrae. Okay. <coughs> And you would agree with me, the longest muscles that I'm talking about run along the spine behind the trachea. Oh, yeah, sure. The most internal structures as far as muscles in the neck. All right, they run all the way down. Those are deep inside the neck, correct? Right, and they're in the back. In the back, behind the trachea, correct? Right, where you couldn't reach, you couldn't reach them just by squeezing the neck. If you caused enough pain, or enough, I'm sorry, excuse me, if you caused enough force with large man-sized hands on a little girl's neck, you could certainly cause those, tr those injuries to the internal components of the neck, correct? Not back down where, you were, where we were looking at. Without, without severe injury to the rest of the neck as well. What it does, as I said, it, it does indicate that there was pressure in that area. Now we're talking about the whole neck here. But the fact that it's in the back and there's quite a bit in the back, would indicate to me I would be more likely to say that this was a compressive type injury. The ultimate outcome is the same. It's a homicide by asphyxia. Space, KB-16. You were talking about the sternocleidomastoid muscle. That's, in fact, the sterno sternocleidomastoid muscles, correct? Yeah, again, it's a little difficult to get the perspective, but... Uh, yeah, that's one of the areas uh, where we have the most hemorrhage. And that's where Dr. Kurz pulled them back and reflected them back, correct? Yeah, correct. And they have hemorrhages on the top, on the middle, and down on the bottom, correct? Correct. All up and down those muscles that go from here all the way up into here. Correct. Correct? Correct. All right. <clears throat> States KB-17. This was the next layer of dissection by Dr. Kurz. Another strap muscle here, correct? Yeah, again, I'm not real sure where that is. But if you reflect this back, I believe it's reflected up. So if you reflect it back. You, you um, mean go back to the first photo? You can see in this photo, maybe his reference is vain. And then in this photo. Correct. But again, on this strap muscle, you have hemorrhaging on the top of the muscle and along the muscle, correct? Well, yeah, and we know, we know, there, was, we know there was trauma to the, that right. area, so we know we're going to have hemorrhage. Right, and there's hemorrhage to this side of the muscle, if you can look up at the photo. And of course, hemorrhage down here, which is where the muscles tie into the sternum, correct? That lower mark. Correct. And would be, that's the, that's the point. The point is it's also down in the area of the sternum. It's down the posterior portion of the neck. And so the we have much more injury yeah. down here, much more hemorrhage than we do up further. So we know we have compression, but we also have compression in the front and the back and it's more, in my opinion, is more consistent with, uh, uh, some, as, as I've indicated, something pressing down and creating that problem. In KB18, this is the photo I started with, it's the deepest reflection of muscles because now we're at the bottom. These muscles here have hemorrhaging on them, and there's hemorrhaging at the top, the anatomic structure where they're being pulled up from, correct? Well, yeah, and he's pulling this back up here. Right. Yeah. Right, he's pulling it up towards the scalp, towards, towards the, the scalp, head, toward the head, because right. the skin has been reflected over Correct, the face. Exactly. Right, so this area here is going to be underneath here, right? Up underneath here? Uh, probably a little lower. And this will be her, like her chin area here, with the skin over it? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. You've reviewed these photos previously, correct? Sure. And you've gone through them to render your opinions in this case? Yes. States KB20. Can you tell us what this is? That's the hyoid bone. The hyoid bone, right? Right. And in this area here, there was hemorrhaging, correct? There was some hemorrhaging, yes. On the hyoid bone. 
The one that you've told us is up in the top part of the neck. Correct. Structures of the neck. Now, all of these hemorrhages inside of these strap muscles and internal muscles of the neck, those are all significant and consistent with strangulation, aren't they? Well, they're consistent with trauma to the neck. Blunt force trauma to the neck. All right. And blunt force trauma to the neck is consistent with strangulation, isn't it? Correct. But what we have to look at is the entire injury pattern. We know there was trauma to that area. If somebody's kneeling down across that area, there's going to be trauma to the area. What doesn't fit with strangulation is, number one, the fact that it, strangulation generally occurs pretty rapidly. Over a few minutes, they're dead. So you don't have the development of a lot of pulmonary edema. And the other thing is all the hemorrhages in the back, right behind where that compression would have been. Right. In an area that for the compressive force to get to, it would have to, to basically flatten all of these structures of the neck, well, including sure. the windpipe to get to. Sure it would. And, and the, the fact is that there's and more hemorrhage down here. I mean, put the higher bone up again uh, real okay. quick. Well, now you're taking it out of isolation, aren't you? Because that's just one injury. Well, you showed it to me. I did. But it's and, one injury out of all the injuries. Point. My point is that there's much less hemorrhage up top than there is down below. States KB20, well, almost all of the hemorrhaging we saw in those strap muscles was up underneath here, around the base of the strap yeah, muscles. Yeah, but you were telling the hyoid bone. The hyoid bone has very little hemorrhage around it. KB21. The one you just showed no, that, okay. has focal hemorrhage, but not a lot of hemorrhage. Right in there. And if you're compressing a child's neck, you're going to have compression to that whole area. The problem is, if you've got less hemorrhage up here than you have down here, it would tend to tell you that the compressive force was down in this area, because that's where the hemorrhage is. And Doctor, you're, you're, you're not back saying back. in strangulation you're not going to get injuries down here, correct? Right. And if you have associated injuries up inside of the structures of the neck, even behind the trachea, that's all consistent with strangulation, isn't it? Well, I also have hemorrhages down below the lower area. You do, but you can't ignore all of these other injuries to the internal muscles of the neck that are consistent, classically consistent with strangulation. Well, we know, right? there was, we know there's compression of the neck. The problem you have is if there's other hemorrhage more severe down lower, and it's in the back area as well, that does not explain, strangulation does not explain how that could have happened. Compression with all with compression of the neck can cause all of those injuries because you're getting compression. You could probably have a kid that's moving around even, so you're having compression. And, and you talk and about taking the, it out of isolation. In addition to the injuries to the internal structures of the neck, I had there's extensive, finish. oh, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to cut you off, go ahead. So it's, the, it's where the distribution of the injury is more severe. And we have, well, we have more hemorrhage front and back down in this area than up here by the hyoid. If you're looking at a little kid and an adult's putting their, his or her ne leg on the, the neck, you're going to have compression to all these areas. But the fact of the matter is, in a strangulation, you tend to get more injury where the force is applied directly. That's up here. And you've just got a little hemorrhage in the, the uh, uh, hyoid bone, and you don't have a lot in the thyroid cartilage. Going down further, though, you start getting hemorrhage both in the front and in the back. So that would tend to indicate that the force is being applied, as we've talked about, ad nauseum across the, this area, but including the neck. It's not like the neck wasn't included. I mean, that, that was down upon the, uh, uh, the knee was down upon the neck as well. So you said that's not taken out of isolation. So let's talk about in addition to all of these hemorrhages, up inside the neck and up and down these strap muscles, you also have petechiae in the eyes and up in the face, correct, of Ms. Williams? Of course. And those are also classic signs of strangulation, correct? They're classic signs of anything that causes a compression, obstruction to the, the backflow, essentially, that causes compression of the jugular veins and uh, increases capillary pressure and causes those little petechiae. The fact that you have it down below is not consistent with strangulation as, nearly as much as it is with a compressive uh, problem. So is that a yes? It's consistent with strangulation? You see it in strangulation, but it's not diagnostic of strangulation. Sure, but it's consistent it. with strangulation, correct? Well, again, you just said we didn't want to take things out of individualized, oh. but we're taking the petechiae. Uh, can it be seen in any type of situation where there is obstruction 
to the return, venous return from the brain to the to the heart. Compression of the jugular vein space. Which includes strangulation, correct? Sure, includes strangulation. Just step one moment. Doctor, you would agree with me that Miss Williams' body was covered, at least the front part of her body was covered with damage um, that occurred while she was in the water, correct? Correct. You don't dispute that, right? Postmortem. I said artifact. damage, I didn't say injuries, because I don't want okay. to get into a semantic argument with you, okay? Right. Post so let's just call them post-mortem damage. Postmortem damage, okay. okay. I'll go with damage. So postmortem damage, right? Right. All right. And you would agree with me that there were anatomical areas of her body where there weren't any injuries, or any damage, excuse me, that were protected areas, such as her underarms, correct? Correct. All right. That is states K-18, and that was her right underarm, states K-19, her underarm and her side leading to her back, right? Correct. States K-56, between her chin and her sternum, there's very limited damage on her neck, correct? Correct. This area here. That's from the back, by the way. But I'm sorry? I think that one was from the back, but that's fine. That right. K-56, you don't see that, but it's her chin right here? <coughs> And this being her sternum, her clavicle right there. Okay. Yeah, they pulled it, they pulled it over. Okay. States K-57. The right side of her neck, underneath her ear, this area. Correct. Is absent of that damage, correct? Yes. And then we know K-63, most of Felicia's back had no injury or not correct. very much damage. And that would indicate she was floating face down, correct? Well, it, probably, but I mean, it's still, you don't know how she might have, the wave action could have moved the body around and caused a lot of okay. changes. All right. K-48. Now let's take a look at this area of her body. You would agree with me that in these areas, in her upper thighs, there are very limited amounts of that same type of damage, correct? Correct, but we do have a couple on this side and a couple on that side. We do, we have a few. I'm not saying they're not there. Here, 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 right. here, here. So it's... But not near the volume that we have on the top sides of her body, correct? No, correct. All right. It's fairly clean, especially down in this area around her groin, around her vagina, correct. correct? And you would agree with me that in addition to being a fairly isolated area of her body, as far as isolated from that damage, it's also anatomically um, protected, correct? Correct. In fact, in states KB31, Either the doctor or a technician is actually having to pull back her skin, her labia, to reveal her, va her vagina and the vaginal entrance. Correct? Yes, correct. All right? And in states KB32, excuse me, KB32, they're having to do the same thing. And you can see the skin being pulled back over here and here, correct? Correct. So this is a naturally protected remote area of the body, correct? Well, Can we put it back up? Correct, yeah, put it back up. States KB31. Yeah, it's protected, and the fact that there's no vital injury uh, is one of the reasons I've determined that it was most likely to uh, occur during the collecting of the samples. And there's no injuries all in here? at least very very limited as far as, this, I say injuries, damage, the post-mortem damage, correct? Yeah, actually, that's a good point because uh, normally in a sexual assault, you're going to have a lot of injuries around that whole area. You're not just going to see a couple of 
a couple of areas. Usually you see a bruising, and you may see lacerations, and you may see hemorrhaging, and a whole lot of things during a sexual assault exam. And the fact that that is so limited, I think, is, is uh, most consistent with having occurred during the sample. Okay. Oh, thank you, Townsend. Do you remember being asked, um, and you do remember your deposition on July 17th of this year? I remember taking it. I don't remember. Yeah, the word. it was taken in Altamont Springs at a court reporter's office near your right, office. Yeah. You remember that? Okay. Um, do you remember being asked? What do you uh, page 131? I'm sorry, counsel. Page page 131, starting at line five. Now, when you say artifact, what do you mean by that? And react. And I'm asking about these injuries. Your response. Well, in other words, somewhere during the movement of the body or whatever, those little pieces of skin were scraped off, but there's no vital reaction. He took sections of it to show there's no hemorrhage. Do you remember that? Yeah. In fact, I think we just, I just testified to that a little while ago. All right. So you're, in a, you're there saying that during the movement of the body, correct? Well, I said or whatever. In fact, uh, I'm, I was happy you brought that question up because I actually then I, start, I dug into it a little deeper when I found out that the actual uh, testing was done the day before on the 17th. So then I was able to say, well, I think that's what did it. Do you remember at page 134, counsel, line 24, question? Right. Well, going back to E, and I had marked the photographs in your deposition. Do you remember that? Right. Okay. Yeah. Is it your opinion that those injuries, that scraping, because you were telling me that that was some type of scraping, is inflicted by the same process that's inflicting all of these abrasions over the rest of the body? Your response was, it's possible, but I don't. It's certainly in an area that you, if you look at this picture, he sort of hasn't spread the thing apart yet. If you look at this picture, and I make a point for the record, the photograph you're showing us, it reflects at the top center of the photograph, the vaginal opening at the middle of the photograph, the anus, right? And you say, yeah, and then these little area of scraping there, and you, and you say, yeah. And I say at the fourchette, and you say at 6 o'clock. And that would be at 6 o'clock, right, in the vaginal yeah, opening? Right. And that is the fourchette, the area of the fourchette? Yes. All right. You say they're just scrapes. The epidermis has just been scraped away. And just like the other, in your other pictures, those other linear things that are taking place. And you were talking about all of these types of injuries, correct? Yeah, I was talking about the fact that they're post-mortem and that there's no vital reaction. And I said possibly, you just read this, possibly due to that, but uh, possibly due to something else. And I think now reviewing that report to show that the, actually she was instrument, in, instrumentation was done uh, is most significant in the fact that that's probably when it occurred. So page 136, line 8, your response is they're just scrapes just like the other, the other pictures, those other linear things that are taking place. <coughs> And then I ask at line 13, do you have any idea how those, how it was scraped? And you say, I don't know, I don't know. You know, conceivably some, you know, a stone got up into the area between her legs or something when she's rolling around. I mean, I don't know, but the fact of the matter is that there is no evidence of injury, so we cannot make a diagnosis. Well, I said I didn't know. That's why I dug, dug deeper into it and found the, the information about the, when the uh, sexual assault examination was done. Yeah, and so in your deposition, after you had reviewed this case, you didn't say anything about those injuries possibly being a, a, or being caused by collection of DNA, correct? No, I didn't realize that that happened until I went back and looked at the at the, uh, at the report again. And you're saying that happened? It's pure speculation, isn't it? Because you don't know that that's what happened, correct? I said it's most likely, but the fact is that those pictures were taken after something was done to this victim. Therefore, the pictures are not what actually existed when the, when the person came out. And the medical examiner indicated in his report that he felt those were post-mortem. So this is not a sexual assault injury. Okay. Well, thank you for telling us that. I didn't ask you that. Let me ask you this. The characteristics of these wounds to the vagina, they're shorter. I'm sorry. Um, they're shorter in length than they are in depth, right? Well, they're, they're superficial. 
but they're shorter in length than they are in depth. Yes. The depth is one to two millimeters, correct? At the most, yes. All right. Which is contrary to all the other scrapings on the top of the body, right? They're all longer than they are correct. deeper. Correct. So correct? I think it, that it may very well likely have been caused by something besides interaction with the rocks. Is that a yes? Yes. Okay. <clears throat> If these were caused anti-mortem, and they were caused by blunt impact, they would be consistent with sexual battery, wouldn't they? In the area they're found in. If they were, but the fact is they're not. Well, I don't know if that's a fact, Doctor. That's your opinion, correct? The, my opinion is that they are post-mortem. If you have a typical sexual assault, as I said, you have lacerations, you have bruising, you have swelling due to the trauma in the area. You don't have just a few scrapes that have no underlying vital reaction indicating they're postmortem. You received your medical degree at the University of Miami? Correct. Did you do any forensic training there or pathology training? No, I indicated early on. I, tra I trained pathology at University of Rochester, Duke, and University of North Carolina. But you're familiar with Dr. Joe Davis, correct? Sure. All right. And he's considered to be the grandfather, basically, of the medical examiner system here in the state of Florida. Is that right? Well, he put it together, yes. Right. He started it, didn't he? Right. From his office in Miami? Correct. And he still maintains that office in Miami, correct? Well, he's deceased. But... Well, is he deceased? Yes. Okay. Well, he did maintain that office he when he was alive. Um. He ran that office for many years out of the University of Miami Medical School, correct? Correct. I think, I think it's still associated with the medical school. All right. Did you ever take classes there? Did you ever do any kind of work at the University of Miami or at their medical examiner facility? Not that I recall. No. Have you ever heard Dr. Davis lecture? Sure. Or teach? All right. So you're familiar with his known emphasis on the importance of the scene where the body is found? in forensic pathology, correct? Well, it depends on what you're talking about. The uh, is, is injury patterns may be more important than the scene. Uh, you don't necessarily know from a scene that that's where something occurred. Uh, you take into account the scene and what happened, but you don't necessarily know that that is even related to. But bodies are moved, they're placed different places, so you have to be very careful. The forensic evidence is basically the findings at the autopsy. But you're sure you're taking into consideration the scene. Correct. That's the whole point I was trying to make. I wasn't suggesting you ignore injuries because that's part of forensic pathology, correct? Correct. All right. So he had an emphasis. I think he made the statement it all hinges on the scene, that you're supposed to take into account the circumstances in which the body is found in, correct? Yes. All right. And as a forensic pathologist, that's an accepted, common, reliable practice, correct? Sure. Correct. To examine the scene, the body, and the circumstances the body is found in. Right? Correct. All right. And those would be hard facts or hard evidence that you talked or hard data that you talked about earlier, correct? Correct. correct. It would be, right? Yes. All right. And when you worked as a medical examiner in Orlando, did the assistant or associate medical examiners go to the scene? Sometimes we did. Early on, we went to the suspected homicide scenes. How about in California? When we you went to there? some scenes. Yeah, we went to some scenes. In How California. about in Georgia? Uh, some scenes, yes. So did you go to all scenes? Was that a commonly uh, accepted practice, or was that some type well, of Well, not all scenes. We have investigators. The medical <clears throat> examiner's office has investigators that go to the majority of the scenes. And if they feel the pathologist needs to come out, then the pathologist will go to the scene. And you have experience going to scenes, correct? Oh, yes. All right. And in this case, taking into account the circumstances that the victim was found in, she was, first of all, found to be nude, right? Correct. When she was found? All right. And the victim was obviously a female, correct? Yes. Right. The victim was a child, right? Well, yes. Nine years of age, right? Correct. Okay. And the victim was found deposited in water, correct? Well, she was in the water. She was recovered from water, correct? Correct. And a female victim being found nude, and being a child, that would be very suggestive of a sexual homicide, would it not? Well, from that scene, but then again, you have to look at the evidence. You have to look at the facts of the case uh, from the forensic standpoint. And we don't have injuries, general injuries. All right. And that's very commonly found to be the case when you have a nude 
female found in water, that it was, has a sexual component to the crime, correct? It all depends on the individual case. All right. There are many, many circumstances that it may be true and may, others that may not. So you can put an individual case, you can't make that assumption and try to more or less, from the forensic standpoint, read that into the case because you're sort of augmenting. We don't know, first of all, we don't know that this was the scene of the, of the incident, probably not. And so this is the scene that she was found, but that doesn't necessarily tie to the scene of when the incident occurred and certainly doesn't affect uh, the finding of the injuries. You're certainly not saying that lack of trauma to her vagina means that she was not sexually battered or not sexually molested, correct? You're not saying that, are you? Negative findings. You can't make a positive diagnosis in the face of negative findings. In other words, sexual assault clearly can occur where there is no injury. In fact, that's the majority of the time, isn't it, doctor? Uh, probably... In my experience, no. In our sexual battery case, we usually had some evidence of injury or at least foreign DNA or something that would tie the individual into the Isn't it situation. true that in less than a third of sexual battery cases and rape cases that there is injury to the genitalia? Less than a third. Well, I would say at least probably a third of reported cases. And i got to remember that uh, reported cases are sometimes ones that are reported later, uh, a whole bunch of things. But... Uh, Generally, you should find some evidence of some, if it's forcible. Now, the individual could be incapacitated, they could be threatened, a lot of reasons for not resisting, so you can't have it. But the problem is, unless you have some concrete positive evidence, you can't make the jump to say, well, this is sexual assault. When you have no findings of anything, no DNA, no injuries. And a female victim, especially a child being found nude in a body of water, and being strangled to death, that would also be very suggestive of a sexual component, correct? No, it would be consistent with a, a asphyxial ha a homicide. And, well, I'm talking about it hypothetically, doctor. I'm not talking about this case, because well, I know you're... it may not be. And again, it may be just consistent with a homicide. Right. And so strangulation is commonly seen in sexual homicides, correct? Well, it's common, uh, not too infrequently seen in clinical sexual assault cases. Is that a yes or survives. a no? Is that a yes or a no? Well, by what do you mean by frequently? It is frequently seen to have a sexual component. Strangulation cases with a nude female. Right? Because it's a very personal crime when you rape somebody, and it's not uncommon for strangulation to be the cause of death, correct? Well, you do see it in sexual assault cases, post-mortem or anti-mortem. So how much longer do you anticipate on cross? Maybe five minutes, Your Doctor, how many liters of blood were in Felicia's body when she was alive? I don't know. That's a clinical that's a clinical issue. I have no way of knowing that. What would you say for a hundred and twenty pound, four foot nine little girl? Over three and a half liters? Oh well, probably. <laughs> Maybe up to four and a half, five liters? Well, again, it depends on if she's anemic and how much blood she has. Uh, I can't ask that question. That's a clinical That's a clinical issue, how much she had. We don't know her circumstances. Uh, so it's, it's, you think that, it was that, less, would, that would be purely speculation. You think it was less than three and a half liters? That would be speculation, so I'm not, I have no opinion. But you would agree with me that it's going to be some amount, most likely less than six liters, correct? You wouldn't expect to see more than six liters of blood in a little girl. Again, you'd have to ask the pediatricians. I don't, I don't keep up with the clinical pediatric blood volumes. I just don't know. You can't give any opinion on that? I don't know, so I'm not going to guess. You have a, you have a uh, experience in um, forensic pathology dealing with cardiology, do you not? 
Cardiac pathology. That simply cardiac means pathology. the diseases of the heart. It has nothing to do with how much blood is going to be in a... It has nothing to do with the cardiovascular system and the... the I don't know how much blood would be in this, in this girl at the time, because I don't know the, any of the extenuating circumstances. Do you, know, do you know how many liters of water there are in Old Tampa Bay? No. May I have one moment, Your Honor? Yes. I would think a lot. I have nothing else, Your Honor. Redirect. No questions, Your Honor. Okay, may this witness be excused? Yes, Your Honor. Okay, thank you, Dr. Thank Rodriguez. you, Your Honor. All right, very good. Um, Fed State for, for, for. objecting to the admission of that evidence. Without her report, and I argued this at the time, I said he can have it marked and try to introduce it. Without her re entire report, it's being taken out of context. Alternatively, we, can, we have no objection to the entire report coming in. Which is hearsay. She didn't testify to the contents of her report. But I think, just as I said earlier with the other witness, that was covered in detail with her on direct, redirect, I'm sorry, Direct cross, redirect, and recross. Um, well, it sounds like that's something you all can then argue about. It seems like we did cover the issue, um, or not we, you all covered the issue with Ms. McFadden regarding her opinion. Mr. Harmon is correct. His exhibit came in without opposition. And if he had objected to it, I don't know what it would have done. So. so in an abundance of caution to avoid an issue on appeal, I'm going to admit defense exhibit two. Okay? Thank you, Your Honor. All right. And you all can argue about the testimony of Ms. McFadden as much as you like in your closing argument. So with that, you're going to admit defense one and defense two? One, 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 A through C, and then two. All right. And then we need to give W back to the clerk? Yeah. Okay. Now run off for exhibits. Okay. All right. And then you can move those into evidence in front of the jury. Yes. And then you'll rest, and then we'll have Dr. Kurtz on the stand. All right? I'm assuming he's here. Can I step up for one second? Yes. One second. He appears he's here. So we're going to do this. He's going to rest, and we're going to break for lunch, and then come back and instruct, or are you going to? Yeah, we're going to wrap up all the testimony, and then we'll come back and do jury instructions. Okay. So while Mr. Green is stepping out, I'm going to grab the jury instructions, which I've been working on. Okay, tell Mr. Armour we need to get going. While we're waiting, um, Mr. Johnson, if you hand Mr. Greenbaum a copy of the jury instructions. This is a whole new set, Judge? It is. Judge, we also have uh, Captain Bull, who's going 
that's why I'm rebuttal to the suggestions about the uh, NOAA report and the information given. Here? And it's a teaser, yeah. All right. How long is this going to take to you? Hopefully not long. Okay. Let's go. Let's bring them in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. All right, Jerry Henry. 